Okay, so, right, there we go. I'm going to also talk as fast as Jake, so that'll, that'll get me under 50 minutes too, so. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the organisers to uh, invite me to this. It's uh, great to be here. I'm really going to be talking about kind of um, two dangers which come out of social movement theory in a way that's relevant to the vegan social movement. Um, so I've called it kind of battle of ideas. There's a battle of ideas going on. Tom Reagan would talk about that. Richard Ryder would talk about that. And this is within the vegan movement uh, in a way. So in terms of uh, what I'm using for theory, obviously social movement theory in general terms, but uh, resource mobilization, which kind of came into being around about the 1970s and then has been adapted uh, ever since in a way, uh, political opportunities, political opportunity structures, um, an idea. Then we're into things like movement takeoff, because this, this is the key for, for the talk in a way, in the sense that we, um, move, movements need to grow, but there's a danger in that growth, which is you know the interesting thing in a sense. And then the issue of professionalization uh, will come into it as well. Because social movements obviously need resources and they also need to mobilize those resources. But as they grow, there's a danger. They need to grow and at the same time, there's a, a danger in growing. It can lead to moderation. It can lead to people coming into the movement without the same core values of the people who founded it. So, that, so that's what's kind of going on um, in the, the vegan social movement. It's also what uh, social movement th theory predicts as well, because again, with the growth, you get professionalization. And that means you get staff, you get officers, you get P45s, um, and you then get a focus on things like fundraising. And so core ideas, the radicalization, revolutionary ideas, and veganism is a revolutionary idea, they, they can start to be kind of, if you like, kind of watered down a little bit. So that, that's what, what it's all about. One of you here will recognize this because this is a quote from Corey. Uh, herself uh, talking about the vegan society and this idea that again with growth you can get a reorientation of priorities that could lead to a kind of moderation of aims and a moderation of claims um, this kind of thing um, to try and illustrate this I've kind of picked out this uh, quote from uh, 1945 by Donald Watson Watson was um, he, he was he was basically asked what's all this uh, newfangled vegan idea all about and he said this is it it's to oppose the exploitation of sentient life and then the this interesting last bit of the sentence um as kate and uh, matthew said uh, he's not around to to correct me on this so this is just my interpretation i mean you could read that i think as a an anti kind of capitalist kind of statement um if if you want to i tend to think of this as a really good concise succinct um, statements about what veganism is all, all about. And I, I prefer that to this, which is obviously what we are familiar with. This is the definition of veganism that everybody knows. And uh, in, in a sense, this is a, a bit more wishy-washy than that. Um, there's a lot of confusion about this definition in the sense that um, a lot of people claim that it's Donald Watson definition, which is not true. They also claim this is the 1940 definition, which is not true on, on the ground that it didn't exist. Um, so this is from 79 through to 88, uh, really. And this is when the, the vegan society was kind of stabilizing and becoming more professional, needed a kind of um, articles of, of memorandum of this kind of stuff. And it, so he needed that because in a sense, we have to realize that the beginning of the vegan social movement was fairly chaotic. You know, Watson was kind of almost left up to it for the first couple of years doing, doing everything, uh, really. Then Leslie Cross, um, towards the end of the 40s into the, into the early 50s, said, well, we don't have a working definition of veganism. We know what the vegan diet means, but we don't know what veganism is. And so, so they started to work on that. And um, there's also... And it's the thing because the vegan movement was almost like located in people's houses at the time, right up until the 1970s, uh, really. In fact, there's, um, there's a kind of in-joke in a way, in the sense that uh, Kathleen and Jack, Jack uh, Janaway, they had the vegan society located in their house. And the in-joke is the fact that their house was in the village in England called Leatherhead. And so uh, that's, I, di I didn't say that the in-joke was very funny. I just said it, it, it was an in-joke. So... So this is the kind of general kind of thing that you get from social movement theory as what I'm calling the first danger. If we move on to the second danger, and this is 
perhaps a bit more important in a way and it's certainly more prevalent in the movement at least at least as i've experienced it recently um, which is the idea that uh, people come into the movement with different values than the people who founded it and that then can create a problem or not i mean when, when we come to the final question we we, we we can we can look at that um, in a sense. What we have to realise, though, that um, you know the vegan social movement began during the so-called Second World War. I always like to say that um, you know the vegans declared peace during this global conflict. You know it was quite a radical thing to do. At least three of them were conscientious objectors, and that meant that they suffered uh, financially because of that. It was a time of rationing, and the rations were cut. Their wages, as it were, were cut because they refused to fight. They, they all said that they don't want to kill anyone, um, including other animals, uh, of course. And so it's a kind of radical thing to do. And uh, as I said in a comment to um, Kate and Matthew, the pioneers have been described as anti-authoritarian. They were kind of radical thinkers in a sense. They, they were gentle English folk as well, so they didn't speak in polemic terms or sound bites as we understand it now. But um, if you, as it were, read their work and read between the lines, there's a lot of radicalism there. You know, veganism is a, a revolutionary idea in a way. Donald Watson said that uh, the experience of the war was shattering. And, you know, people are a product of their time. It's interesting in the sense that difficult for us in the 21st century to go back there and, and really experience what they experienced. But he said it was absolutely shattering. We can only do it now in films. In fact, there's a Netflix documentary at the moment uh, about Alan Turing. Um, it's not a documentary, it's a, it's a drama. But that's quite interesting, you know, it, it kind of feeds into what it must felt felt like to be going to war, experiencing war, you know, all that, that worth, worth checking out. Essentially then, the early vegan pioneers, they were trying to work out why had humanity got so violent, uh, almost like a new kind of um, barbarism. What, what, what was going on? They'd, they'd witnessed two global conflicts in short order. They'd lived through them, they'd experienced them, and they thought that something had gone wrong with humanity. And very seriously, they came to the conclusion through their analysis that veganism was the solution to this issue. And in fact, they came to the conclusion, and we might think of this as a bit arrogant in a way, but they came to the conclusion that veganism at that time was the only movement that could save humanity. They, they actually actually made that claim. In fact, uh, this, is, um, this is from Donald Watson saying that veganism is the greatest cause on earth. And he used this metaphor of the Titanic and essentially he was kind of using the idea that veganism was an overarching principle that could be applied everywhere in, in a sense. He said that, you know, veganism was, as it were, looking holistically at the old shebang, whereas other movements were just like taking little bits of, uh, uh, apart. So it's kind of a holistic, Kind of view. As I said, it could be re regarded as an arrogant statement. It was before second wave feminism, it was before the civil rights movement, so that kind of thing is kind of not factored in, in a way. But that's really what they felt, that we need to, if we want a non or less violent world, then veganism provides the principles for it, you know, and that, that's a quite an interesting idea. Um, this one uh, comes from 1954, this is Leslie Cross, Surge of Freedom and um, Cross focuses on this issue of focus and scope. That veganism as a philosophy was always out of focus and scope. The focus is on our relationships with other animals, but the scope has always been wider than that. And in fact, in this essay, he starts with the scope rather than the focus. So he talks about what veganism can do for mankind. Again, pr products of their time. So they, they use a lot of sexist language in, in these early days, just as you find in in all the sociology uh, textbooks from, from the time. But again, this kind of revolutionary idea is contained within you know, the founding statements of our movement, really. This one comes from uh, Donald Watson. He talked about veganism as being the greatest peaceful revolution ever known. And another grand claim, if you like, but also in the better interests of men and animals alike. So again, another kind of, if you like, strident statement. This is one of my favorites. This is from 64. This is a pamphlet by Eva Batt. Eva Batt actually was famous for making uh, or publishing vegan cookbooks, but she also did this pamphlet called Why Veganism. And she said this, which is a very strong statement. 
you know, veganism is one thing and one thing only. And it's talking about um, avoiding exploitation and that as human beings, other animals and the soil, which is an interesting one. The idea that the soil can be exploited is, is an interesting idea. But again, I think this is a really kind of strong statement of foundational values of the movement. And this is, as it were, under threat uh, right now. This one really is um, a summary of, um, of the thing. This is uh, Kath Clements looking back in the 1990s at vegan values and basically saying that it's about having a consistent approach to human rights and animal rights, ecology and world food problems. So we would call world food problems food security issues now nowadays. Ecology obviously would be environmentalism. And so again, it's this entangled concerns that um, were the things that founded the movement. And as I said before, I think that uh, if the vegan social movement was founded with the values that it was founded with now, we would probably call it pro-intersectional in that sense. It's, it's a revolutionary idea, very, very kind of radical. And in some senses, has been kind of watered down, you know, but these are the foundational values of the vegan social movement. They're kind of under attack, really, in the sense that I say there's a new generation of reducitarians in the vegan movement, and they kind of come in a, in a couple of ways. One of them is this guy you might be familiar with. This is the vegan strategist, Tobias Leonhardt, and uh, essentially he wants to rewrite veganism and redefine it to vegetarianism. And on the grounds that if you lower the bar of entry into the vegan club, then more people would enter it. And so you get a, a large population of vegans who are, aren't actually vegans in, in, in any kind of sense, certainly not to, in a dietary sense. And then this one comes from um, a conversation I had with uh, a co-founder of uh, one of the, the largest um, international groups that, that exist at the moment. And this is the other strand that's going on at the moment. There's quite a lot of uh, right-wing influences in the movement at the moment, and they're trying to eliminate the human rights elements of veganism. Um, and they're trying to bring in welfare language, talk about cruelty and everything, whereas Leslie Cross said that we're not welfare, we're liberation and this kind of stuff. But um, essentially what they're trying to do is say that veganism is about um, animals only. When they say animals only, they obviously mean non-human animals. Um, so that, you know, so they, they don't even include uh, humans as animals in, in that sense. And so there's this kind of battle of ideas that is going on in the movement. And I'm gonna end with this idea in the sense that um, this, is, this is kind of like, sums up what we're dealing with in this battle of idea within the, the movement, it's a movement issue. Is it, um, I think it's important to recapture the radical or the radicalism of the early vegan philosophy. Whereas other people say, well, you know, let it go. I mean, veganism now is moving into the mainstream. And so you've kind of got to go with the flow. You've got to adapt. I mean, obviously we know from social movement theory that social movements move. That, that's not in, in any doubt. In terms of mainstreamness, there's a really interesting YouTube by Patrice Jones. It's called Commonalities of Oppression. You, you, you could check that out. It's really interesting because uh, Patrice says that, uh, you know, the mainstream is not the majority. It kind of implies a majority, but it's not the majority. The majority are the collection of marginalized oppressed people, and they make up the majority. And the advantage there in terms of alliance politics is the fact that they are radical people. They're oppressed already, and they, they get it in, in terms of being oppressed. They're, they're the people that we can make alliances with in, in Steve Best's kind of terms. And so, you know, that's the... That's the kind of dilemma, and this is what's playing through in the vegan social book right now. Should we redefine it? Should we moderate it? Should we professionalize it? You know, there's all, there's all these uh, YouTube um, entrepreneurs and everything now, you know, making, making sack loads of, of, of cash out of the movement. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in the movement. And interestingly, it's all predicted by social movement theory. So those are the, the last questions that I'll leave you with. And... Um, I think I was under time, so there we are. So thanks very much, and I'll stop sharing.